Well, that's what we're doing here. This is No, I am originally from the south, so we're very slow. <laughs> Michael got my ass off the dime, and we finished this book. So, we're from myself. Oh, we've got a couple questions. <laughs> uh, got a couple questions. Yes. Are you still performing? I'm, I'm sorry? Are you still performing? I do a few days. You know, I, I retired in 2005, and, um, you know, I've been on the road for like 45, 50 years, and I finally said, you know, I've had enough. And my old friend and band leader, Lady, <laughs> called me and said, you know, they want to book you again. I said, you got to be kidding. <laughs> and um, he kept prodding me and prodding me. I resisted at first. And then in 2012, he finally talked me into doing three dates of the camera. And so I went up with the old man that I'd worked with for so many years, and we had such a great time, I decided to try it again for a few years. Anything in Los Angeles? I did Cerritos last year, the Civic Center. And that was a great day. We enjoyed that. We don't have anything planned right now, but I mean, that could change. Are you still living in Georgia? Are you living I have a home in Georgia. I've always kept a home in Georgia all these years. And I came out here in 1965 at the request of Dick Clark. You all remember him. And uh, I was living in New York at the time. And Dick called me, and uh, he had just moved everything out here from Philadelphia. And he called and said, you know, Tommy, I'm doing this new show called Where the Action Is. And we'd love for you to come out to Los Angeles and be a part of it. So I moved out here. I didn't move here, I came out and he said, you'll only be here for six months. So I came out to do the show, we'll take the shows and you can go back to New York. I'm still here, I never went back to New York. Uh, as you all know, California is very addictive, great place to live. I have a home here, I have had a home here since 1966. And in Atlanta as well. We all hope you'll do a show here. Well, we'll try to put one together. You never know. You know, uh, we all want to know about the Beatles. Of course, I, you know, when I first went to England in 1963, uh, Sheila was a big hit over there as well. And uh, Chris Montez, my old friend Chris Montez, and I were headliners of this show in England. And on, on the bill with us was a featured act called the Beatles. Who the Beatles were in 1963. And uh, I used to joke with them, with John especially. John was my pub buddy. We used to hang out the pubs together a lot. And I used to joke with him, uh, you know, John, it's because of our tour you guys are where you are. You know that. <laughs> And uh, we had a lot of fun and great memories. I was going to say, uh, talking about that, uh, one of those English tours, Del Shan was a friend of mine. He did the same thing in 63 before they were anybody. Yeah. And he has the distinction, or had the distinction, of being the first American artist to cover a Lennon McCartney tune. That's right. Summer of 63 did For Me and You. That's right. And he said that. He said to Lennon, because he liked the song, because of course that was different at that moment, so he really liked me. He told John, I'm going to record that song. John said, that's great. And then he said, oh no, you better not, because they were trying to break in America. Right. And they didn't want to cover it. Really, you know? That's right. Yeah. But it actually charted in the summer of 63. It never went real high, but still. I remember Dale's version of that. Yeah. I, Dale was a great friend of mine. Yeah. I did the, the last show he did, I was on the bill with him. Oh. I think it was either South Dakota or North Dakota. Oh, yeah. And uh, then before he died, and he, he came back to L.A., everything was looking good for him. He was going to be a part of the uh, Wilburys. Right. They were, they were talking about it, sure. And he was excited about that. And when we heard about what happened, it was just devastating because I'd been with him like a week before. Yeah. You know, he had um, he had some depression. You know, he was a recovering alcoholic. Oh, I know that. You know all that stuff. But I knew Jody very well. In fact, we were good friends. Uh, his daughter, and she called me in the middle of the night to tell me what happened because it hadn't even gotten out yet for the media. And he had gotten on that Prozac, which in those days right. was untested more or less yeah and unfortunately things just happened they had some uh, bad experiences with that drug uh, with the oh, yeah. uh, with the military people who came back yes were on it and they had a lot of suicides yeah in fact uh, his widow and a great guy i mean we had some good times i worked with him in england but, you know here did you ever do any shows with him in the early years or was it much later uh it was 
he was really successful before me, right? I mean, he was successful in the late 50s. Yeah. And uh, I think... Uh, you were doing bus tours? Huh? Were you doing bus tours? Oh, yeah, bus tours. But not buses like today. I mean, no. No, no great about buses, you know. Right. Dick was very... You know, he wanted to oh, save yeah. money. Yep. Like, some of the guys used to sleep in the luggage racks on these oh. buses. I mean, if you can imagine this, I mean, we'd, we'd do a show and we'd pack it in and drive all night to the next city. And uh, they were like death marches. I mean, they were tough. Hard oh, yeah. But, you know, being young, it's okay. I mean, you can handle it. But I wouldn't want to do that today. No, gosh. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah, well, Ray Stevens is still well, good. I really just saw Ray in Nashville. You know, he's, he had, Ray played on Sheila. He played on some of my oh, really? records. Oh, yeah. Dang, and bad. in the book, I have a photo of Ray on my first session in Nashville. He's playing the piano and rehearsing. <laughs> and um, a lot of my friends have passed away. You know, Billy Joe Royal and Joe South passed away last year. They were very good friends of mine. Uh, we did the Ed Sullivan show together. Um, you know, we're losing a lot of our... A lot of the survivors. Yeah. Yeah, survivors of the 60s, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's saying something, man. Yeah, Michael, what about Freddie Cannon? Freddie, I see Freddie a lot. You know, Freddie's still out there. He's, he's still working, too. I saw him on the Rock Shop Memories Cruise. We brought him out. It was great. Yeah, Freddie's out there working. Chris there. Montez, of course, is still working. Um, I've known Chris since 1963. Actually, I met Chris in 1962, which I write about in the book, on my first big tour. It was with Sam Cooke. You all remember Sam wow. Cooke. And uh, on that tour was Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, uh, Jerry Butler and the Impressions, and some, and some other acts. There were about five acts on that show, and Chris and myself were on that tour. So that's how I met Chris, was in 1962 on that tour. And we just hit it off. I mean, Chris is such a sweetheart of a guy, easy to be around, and just a lot of fun. And um, it was good that then when we got booked in England, that was just perfect because we, we just clicked together. You know? Yeah, I met him once. He was very nice. Oh, he's a super soft, guy. Kind of soft, he does a great show. Yes, we did. Uh, I think it was two years ago, we went to Liverpool together and did the uh, Cavern Club, which is, the, uh, I think it was the 50th anniversary of the Beatles. And they had a big festival in, in Liverpool where Chris and I went and did that together. That was a lot of fun. Being on the uh, ground floor of the Beatles, that whole phenomenon you know, of the Beatles, was, uh, I mean, people, it, even during the tour, if you remember Hard Day's Night, the movie, well, that's how our tour was. And it was wild and crazy. And so when we would finish our show and leave the, the uh, theater, they would chase, the fans would chase you down the street. <laughs> and if they couldn't find a beetle to chase, they'd chase Chris. <laughs> The funny part is, when they caught you, they, then they didn't know what to do. Like, well, now what do we do? Let's go outside your paper or whatever. I mean, it was really something to be on the ground floor that uh, of being I was really excited. They were, and, um, you know, I write about that in the book. Of course, you know, when they first started calling my music bubblegum music, I resented it. It was right. kind of a slap in the face because of the simplicity of it. Right. But... You know, later on I embraced it, and you know, bubblegum music today is very popular. You know, it's it's uh, happy music; people love it. They come to the shows and they smile and sing along. You know, it's not much wrong with that. But uh, you're right; the early Beatles love me too. Please, please me. I want to hold your hand. I mean, as I say in the book, what's the difference in those and most sweet people? No, it's true, hundred percent. But. Uh, being breeded British, that whole thing, the British invasion, that was that was the, um, the I did it. Yeah. That, you know, the tag that, that, that they ended up with. And the thing is, they were channeling American rock and roll. Oh, when I was touring with them in England in '63, they were full of questions. They wanted to know oh, yeah. if I'd met Buddy Holly, yeah, sure. or if I'd met Elvis, uh, what's it like in Massachusetts? I mean, there was just one question after that. They never dreamed they'd ever get to America. Right. They didn't have a clue what fate had in store for them. No. Neither did Brian Epstein. Brian Epstein had a uh, a stable of artists, and he figured I better, you know place my bets on several acts right. instead of one, he didn't have a clue that Beatles were going to be successful. Like they well, they had trouble breaking in America in 63. Nobody really wanted them. Well, I talk about in the book, right. trying to get my label to sign. Yeah. 
you'll have to read my book. It's all in there. There's some great Beatles stories, and of course I talk about my life and childhood on up to the present time. Um, if you want sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you won't write my book. <laughs> it's not about that. It's about a life. It's about my life and the people I've met along the way and the influence music has had on our culture and politics and life in general and especially about the 60s decade. So I hope you enjoy it. It's, I'm very proud of it and I'm great to work with Michael on this book. He's just a very talented and his wife edited the book. She could be here today. Yeah. <laughs> From the line asked me today when I said that I was coming, do you still tour? What, what yeah, I just doing? answered that I earlier. I don't think you were here, but uh, I, I retired in 2005, and then my old friend and band leader talked me into doing some dates in 2012. And then I told you you sounded better than ever. Yeah. <laughs> Diane's been my friend and fan for years and years, and we kind of. When I first moved to California, I met Diane, yep. and her ex-husband was uh, was my music director and toured with me here in California. Worked with the. Gary Paxton and all those guys. So we go back a long way. I remember when we were like 30 years old and we were saying, oh my God, do you it's realize over. in 2000 how old we're going to be? Do you think we'll make it to 2000? Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, that's true. I always thought, it, you know, because I started so young. I wrote Sheila when I was 14 years old. So, um, I mean, I was such a youngster when I, I became successful at a very young age. And 30 years old to me at that time really sounded ancient. You know? I was like, oh my God, what do I do when I reach 30? But uh, here I am. I'll be 75 May 9th, uh, 2017. Uh, I'm hanging in there for an old geezer. <laughs> I uh, still enjoy myself. Yeah. I'm enjoying the fans. I appreciate you guys coming out here so much. Um, that's really why I came back in 2012 and started doing shows again. I, my fans were always in touch on Facebook and on my website, and I thought, I need to go out and see those guys again. You know, so. Appreciate you coming by. I'll be happy to sign your books for you. And, and I guess we just kind of do that up here. You know who he is. Like he's, he's produced everybody in the business. <laughs> he is a producer extraordinaire. <laughs> Single gold records, you know, unheard of. You know, they're all albums now or something else.